would like to suggest to you, Daniel, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is not a diet book. To claim that Daniel is a diet book is a lot like suggesting we read the story about the parting of the Red Sea, God crushing the Egyptians, and then writing a book called How to Swim Like an Egyptian. It doesn't make any sense at all. It would be as if we took Luke chapter 24, where Jesus, after the resurrection, walked on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, six miles, revealing himself in every Old Testament book, and then we called it the Road to Emmaus Fitness Plan. You'd go, well, that's not what it's really all about. Bingo! If you and I understand the meaning or message of a book differently than the original audience and certainly different than what the author intended, we have got it wrong. Daniel, not a diet book. What is this book about that might help us with our modern day Christian conundrums? Good question. Let's go to the book itself. In Daniel chapter 3, we see some repeated words, a couple of them. O king, and the king set up. O king, you did this, O king. O king, what are you going to do now? O king, what's happening in your kingdom right now? O king, O king, O king. So clearly the author is trying to tell us this is about a supposed king who set up this object of worship. Hmm, it's a little bit of a hint. So then when we read in Daniel chapter 4, these words, he, God, does according to his will, no one can restrain his hand or say, what have you done? So what we see in the book of Daniel is a battle of two kings. You see, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, and then you see the king of the universe going at it. Guess who wins? It's not the guy who ended up living like an animal for a number of years. The king of the universe wins each and every time, and that is the point of the book of Daniel. Even though the boys were taken into captivity, God still reigns, which also is very helpful in helping us understand the biblical book of Daniel. Why were the boys in Babylon? Good question. Two answers, two covenants. The Abrahamic covenant. You remember this was a promise that God made to Abraham, one-sided, for a land, a nation, and a seed. This piece of property, a group of people called the Jews, so that a seed, Jesus, could come out of that set-apart people. That was a covenant God promised to keep forever. But there was a second covenant. This is the big one. It has more books containing the laws of Moses in the Mosaic Covenant. This is the quid pro quo covenant. Jews, you act like this, I do this. You act like this, I do that. Read Deuteronomy 28. The concept was for the Jews to behave, follow God's laws. God would bless them like a nobody's business. The rest of the world would look and go, hey, look at how blessed they are. Who is their God? Exodus 19, it was God's evangelism program. That is basically what you see happening in the book of Daniel and many of the books in the Old Testament. The Jewish people had been nutty. They disobeyed the Mosaic Covenant, so God takes them over to Babylon, crushes the entire nation. They're all dispersed, but because of his promise in the Abrahamic Covenant, he ends up sending them back. And so we catch up on the story with Daniel and the boys. They are dispersed. They're over in Babylon where they are forced to eat really rich food, and they say, can't violate our conscience that way, so if you don't mind, we'll just eat vegetables. What was the result? The result was they gained weight. Now, that doesn't sound much like a diet plan to me, does it to you? What was the point of it? It was to prove, O oh, king, that God is actually reigning here. God's got it under control, and he'll do whatever he wants to do, not you. 